Hey everyone, it's Dr. Mark Hahn. Uh, in our last lecture for the cardiovascular physiology series, we're going to talk about how mean arterial pressure is regulated uh, over the long and short term. We're going to talk about reflexes as well as some pathologies. So changes in blood volume affect mean arterial pressure. Long-term regulation of mean arterial pressure is through control of blood volume by the kidneys. So for example, to compensate for an increased blood pressure, the kidneys will excrete fluid in urine to decrease blood volume and cause a decrease in blood pressure. So we can see um, in the face of increased blood pressure, the kidneys will comp compensate, you'll have increased urination, increased filtration, therefore having a decrease uh, in blood volume. Kind of the same way when we have hypertensive patients, we give them drugs called antidiuretic drugs, um, uh, or diuretic drugs, excuse me. Diuretic drugs actually encourage urination so that we can have a decrease in blood volume. Um, diuretic drugs work on by inhibiting the antidiuretic hormone, um, as well as encourage um, an increase in urination. So, um, a drug, an example of a drug or a diuretic drug includes hydrochlorothiazide, which again will increase urine output to help decrease blood volume in order to return blood pressure to normal. Uh, to, to compensate for a decrease in blood pressure, uh, the kidneys will uh, decrease urination uh, and filtration in order to conserve or to prevent the loss of blood volume and increase blood pressure. It's kind of difficult to um, increase blood volume, but instead of increasing blood volume, kidneys will preserve uh, the blood volume that's already there by um, decreasing uh, urination. So this is to compensate for a decrease in blood pressure. Short-term regulation of mean arterial pressure is done by compensation of the cardiovascular system through what's known as the baroreceptor reflex. Uh, baro means pressure, and baroreceptors are basically just uh, pressure receptors. Baroreceptors in the body um, can be found in the walls of the carotid arteries and in the arch of the aorta. Uh, these receptors sense the changes in pressure of blood, either flowing to the brain or flowing to the rest of the body. Um, an increase in blood pressure will cause these baroreceptors to send a message to the cardiovascular control center in the medulla uh, to initiate an appropriate response. So, for example, um, the medulla may uh, send a signal to uh, cause vasodilation. Um, or venodilation to decrease peripheral resistance um, and a decrease in cardiac output to help also to decrease blood pressure uh, to the normal range. Now the baroreceptor reflex is actually pretty uh, rapid and occurs within two heartbeats of the stimulus once the baroreceptors sense any changes in blood pressure. Before we get into the baroreceptor reflex arc, just a quick review of uh, what makes up reflexes. So all reflexes actually follow a reflex arc, and there are five components to the reflex arc. First, you have the receptor that picks up the stimulus. The stimulus is then sent up a sensory or afferent fiber that goes to the integration center within the central nervous system. From the uh, integration or processing center, the CNS will then send a signal usually this is a motor signal uh, via an efferent fiber to the effector organ, the, the skeletal muscle or any organ that could secrete hormones. So there are five components to this reflex arc, and you can see these five components in the baroreceptor reflex arc. So here are the components of the baroreceptor reflex arc. Uh, we know that baroreceptors will respond to changes in pressure. So we have baroreceptors in the carotid arteries as well as the arch of the aorta and quite possibly in the kidney. Uh, from the baroreceptors, uh, the stimulus will then um, 
go up the afferent nerve. In this uh, example, we see that the afferent nerve is cranial nerve 9. Cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, this serves as important sensory afferent nerves um, and sends the signal to the integrating center, which is the cardiovascular center in the medulla. Um, from the medulla, we have integration or processing of this signal, this sensory signal, um, and then the processing center will then send its own signal um, to basically respond to this stimulus. Uh, it will go down the motor efferent fibers um, to the effectors, and effectors in this case are basically anything that could change the blood pressure. So the bearer reflex, again, involves several effectors. Uh, the cardiovascular center uh, in the medulla will um, increase um, parasympathetic activity and decrease sympathetic activity to slow down the heart and dilate the arterioles. Um, efferents such as the cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve uh, go to different uh, vessels. Uh, we can see that parasympathetic innervation goes mostly to the atria, and that's where we have the uh, sinoatrial node. Um, and then we have sympathetic motor efferents going to uh, the heart, uh, the vessels, kidneys, and adrenal glands. And we know um, from previous lectures that the vessels are under sympathetic control only. So for example, we see uh, the stimulus is an increase in mean arterial pressure by 10 me uh, millimeters mercury. The baroreceptors will pick this up um, because we want to have a response of decreasing mean arterial pressure by 10 millimeters mercury. So baroreceptors will pick up the stimulus of an increase in mean arterial pressure, um, will send the uh, signal up a sensory afferent fibers, specifically the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve uh, 9, and then it will be integrated or processed at the cardiovascular center in the medulla. Um, what will happen is you'll have, in response to an increased pressure, uh, you'll have um, an increase in parasympathetic responses uh, to the atria, so the um, efferent fibers will go to the atria, the SA node, um, and it will have negative effects on the heart. So for example, uh, it will tell the heart to uh, decrease heart rate. We have chronotropy, it should be chrono, not chromo. Uh, increased stroke volume or increased strength of contraction, inotropy. And then increase in conduction or dromotropy. Um, so basically having a negative uh, or decrease effects on the heart. Now, um, in response to increased pressure, uh, the cardiovascular center will um, decrease the amount of sympathetic effects going to the effectors. So uh, we'll have a decreased effects on the vessels, the kidneys, and the adrenals. So for example, with the vessels, it will cause a vasodilation to decrease the total peripheral resistance. Uh, we want to decrease blood volume. Um, through the loss of volume uh, through urination of the kidneys. Um, and then we want to have a decrease in the release of epinephrine, all in response to an increase in blood pressure so that the appropriate response would be to uh, decrease uh, blood pressure. If we have the opposite happening, if we have a decrease in blood pressure, so a decrease in mean arterial pressure by 10 millimeters mercury, again, the baroreceptors will pick this up, um, send the stimulus up the sensory afferent nerves, the uh, cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal nerve, to the cardiovascular center and medulla. And in this case, the opposite will happen. It will decrease the parasympathetic effects um, on the sinoatrial node so that we have an increase um, in heart rate, increase in stroke volume or strength of contraction, and an increase in conduction. Um, the cardiovascular center will also increase sympathetic um, activity on the heart, 
uh, increased sympathetic activity on the vessels causing uh, vasoconstriction to increase total peripheral resistance. Um, it will have its effect on the kidneys by um, uh, decreasing the amount of uh, urine that is lost. So we have, uh, we maintain our blood volume by peeing less or urinating less, and then it will have sympathetic effects on the adrenal glands with an increase in the sympathomimetics, uh, specifically epinephrine. So the baroreceptor reflex response to orthostatic hypotension. Um, orthostatic hypotension occurs when there is a decrease in blood pressure with a change in position, specifically from a lying down position to abruptly standing. Um, this usually affects young, fit women, uh, elderly patients with blunted baroreceptors, or fit athletes that already have low blood pressure. Um, these groups, when they go from a lying position to standing abruptly, uh, have the tendency to faint um, when this occurs. So orthostatic hypotension occurs when there is um, blood pooling in the lower body caused by a decreased venous return. There's also a decrease in cardiac output and a decrease in mean arterial pressure. Um, as a response to this, we know that the bearer receptors will be stimulated to help restore mean arterial pressure. So we know that the bearer receptor reflex is important for regulating mean arterial pressure quickly in the short term. Now this figure shows how blood is distributed to various organs when the body is at rest. Now usually more than two-thirds of the cardiac output is rooted to uh, the digestive tract and the liver, uh, to skeletal muscles, um, and the kidneys. So the exercise processor reflex is one of those reflex that will help control partition of blood flow. Um, this is an anticipatory reflex, basically a feed-forward control which anticipates um, what happens when we, when we exercise. So basically, uh, partition control is we are um, directing blood flow to areas of the body that will need it, especially during exercise. Um, so when we exercise, we are going to have an increase in sympathetic activity and the release of sympathomimetic hormones. Um, so this will cause a uh, vasoconstriction um, and a venoconstriction. So basically we have um, uh, an increase in venous return. Um, we want to have uh, a global venoconstriction to increase blood flow to the heart, uh, so this increases venous return. We also have um, eventually a local or specific dilation that we talked about due to an increase in metabolites from exercise. Again, these local chemicals that cause an active hyperemia. So again, um, blood will be partitioned to uh, skeletal muscle in response to exercise and other organs that will need an increase in blood volume, such as uh, the brain, the heart, um, and the kidneys. So meanwhile, um, it will also decrease cardiac output to other organs that, that don't need it during exercise. Okay, so we can see an increase in um, blood flow going or cardiac output going to the specific organs. Again, this is the exercise processor reflex. So we have a non-specific constriction globally or systemically, and then locally we'll have a more localized or specific dilation. Okay, causing an active hyperemia. Again, that hyperemia kind of directing um, uh, heat away from the body. So going into pathology, we're going to start talking about um, uh, arteriosclerosis. Um, arteriosclerosis is any condition that causes deposits on blood vessels, making them e either narrower or harder, so less pliable. Um, a lot of people get arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis confused. Um, 
Arteriosclerosis is the name of the generalized condition, whereas atherosclerosis is a type of arteriosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is actually the most common form of arteriosclerosis. What you have is the formation of an atheroma. So basically a formation of a deposit. Um, so first we have um, a basically a deposit or plaque which is initiated by damage in the arterial wall. So we'll have damage um, to the arterial wall and then uh, these plaques will deposit upon um, the damaged sites um, and then it, enough accumulation can occur where these deposits can rupture and then cause um, a thrombosis or a clot. So atherosclerosis, basically um, a deposit of cholesterol that accumulates um, on damaged arterial walls causing uh, clots. So these clots will occlude the lumen of uh, the arterial wall. Um, because we occlude or decrease the radius, um, we end up uh, getting conditions such as um, hypertension or um, because it, more pressure is needed to force blood through that occluded um, artery. Or we could have uh, the thrombus basically causing um, an occlusion of uh, blood vessels down the line. Um, this can cause uh, uh, such uh, conditions like myocardial infarction, which we'll get into. So hypertension, uh, we know that um, prolonged increases in blood pressure um, increases the relative risk of cardiovascular disease. Hypertension we define as a blood pressure greater than um, 130 millimeters mercury for systole um, and a diastolic blood pressure um, greater than 80. Um, the we have primary and secondary hypertension. Primary, about 9% we know is idiopathic. God only knows, we don't know the underlying cause of this type of hypertension. Um, and then we have uh, secondary hypertension, which is basically uh, makes up 10% that is linked to other underlying conditions uh, like pregnancy, for example. We can have gestational hypertension um, or um, other causes. Uh, now, prolonged hypertension can be a little bit dangerous because then we have um, our baroreceptors that we talked about that will eventually adapt to the higher pressure. Uh, uh, prolonged hypertension can also cause damage to arterial walls and lead to deposits um, causing uh, atherosclerosis. Um, other types of cardiovascular disease, disease include cardiac hypertrophy. This is when you have an increase in muscle size, and we talked about this earlier. Basically, um, the muscle is working harder uh, so that it can um, compensate um, and create an increase in cardiac output, but um, prolonged cardiac hypertrophy can eventually cause fatigue and heart failure, which will eventually reduce cardiac output. Um, another pathology that we talk about is myocardial ischemia um, or an infarction. Basically, you have a lack of blood flow. Um, with a lack of blood flow, you have a decrease in um, the amount of oxygen that is being transported to the heart. And this is usually due to arterial occlusion um, and or reduced cardiac output. Um, and this can cause symptoms of chest pain or angina. So a myocardial infarction, also known as a heart attack, uh, basically what will happen is you have occlusion of a blood vessel that causes the muscle in that area to become ischemic uh, and potentially die. Um, stem cells can be are, are used to promote angiogenesis to restore uh, blood flow. Um, angiogenesis, basically angio meaning uh, ves vessel genesis production of. So this would be the production of new blood vessels to kind of help compensate for the um, lack of blood flow to the area. Reactive hyperemia, this is when you have an increased blood flow uh, following the occlusion. You have a build up of local metabolites, which will cause excessive dilation. Um, and then this rapid return of blood flow can cause a reperfusion damage. The next pathological condition we'll talk about is edema. Um, we talked about 
starling forces earlier, basically the forces that will either um, produce filtration of fluid out of the capillary or an absorption of fluid back into um, the vessels. Edema occurs when you have a swelling of tissues where filtration of fluid out of the capillaries is greater than the forces that, uh, that produce uh, absorption of this fluid. And there are three factors that can disrupt uh, the normal balance between capillary filtration and absorption. The first factor is when you have an increase in hydrostatic pressure. Uh, this increase in hydrostatic pressure will basically increase filtration of fluid out of the vessel. Um, and usually this can be due to or it can indicate an elevated venous pressure due to heart failure. So basically what happens is the ventricle will lose its pumping power and can no longer pump all the blood that's sent to it. And this causes a backing up of blood. Um, this backing up of blood will increase hydrostatic pressure, which will then increase filtration of fluid out of the vessel. So again, increase hydrostatic pressure um, causing edema. A second factor that can cause edema is a decrease in plasma proteins. Um, if we have a decrease in plasma proteins, because we know that the um, most of the plasma proteins are located within the capillaries, we don't have a lot of, um, if any, proteins within the interstitium. Um, those plasma proteins are responsible for uh, net absorption or fluid going back into uh, the capillaries. If we have a decrease in plasma proteins, such as in the cases of severe uh, malnutrition, this will decrease the amount of absorption that it can occur or the uh, decrease in the amount of pulling of fluid from the interstitium back into the capillaries. Again, uh, the fluid will remain in the interstitium and cause swelling and edema. Another factor that can cause edema um, can be due to an increase in interstitial proteins due to excessive leakage or increased capillary permeability. So excess leakage of proteins out of the blood, um, which will decrease colloid osmotic pressure, again, that pressure that um, encourages of uh, pulling in of fluid back into the capillary. And um, if we have a decrease in colloid osmotic pressure, um, this will increase net capillary filtration, so fluid will uh, leak out or uh, will uh, stay within the interstitium again, resulting in uh, edema and swelling of tissues. Um, so we talked about um, a decrease in blood proteins. Um, I don't know if you can see the picture. Um, so there is a picture in your book of a patient with quashiorkor. So quashiorkor is a pathological a pathological condition basically causing protein malnutrition. Um, the picture, which is no longer on your PowerPoint for whatever reason, um, shows a Nigerian refugee. You can actually see this picture in the book. Um, the uh, patient it ha shows the characteristic abdominal edema. This is known as ascites. It's caused by a decrease in protein plasma concentration, uh, usually due to severe malnutrition. Um, another cause of edema is obstruction of lymphatic vessels, uh, which decreases drainage. So inadequate lymph drainage occurs when there is an obstruction in the lymphatic system, particularly at the lymph nodes. Uh, parasites, cancer, or fibrotic tissue growth um, uh, caused by therapeutic radiation can cause, uh, can block movement of lymph uh, through the lymphatic system. Um, a parasitic condition uh, can cause what's known as elephantiitis. Elephantiitis is a chronic condition where there is gross enlargement of the legs and lower appendages when parasites uh, block the lymph vessels. So lymph drainage um, can also be impaired um, if lymph nodes are removed during surgery. Uh, we can have removal of the lymph nodes um, during a common procedure in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. So that is the section of cardiovascular physiology um, pertaining to pathological conditions as well as uh, baroreceptor reflexes, and that is the end.
of the cardiovascular physiology chapter. But before we end this chapter, I should probably talk about the treatment of edema. So treatment of edema can vary depending on the severity of the edema. There are simple ways to treat edema, including elevating the limbs to encourage the flow of fluid back to the heart, or even wearing compressive stockings for the legs. Um, there's pharmacological treatment, which involves uh, giving diuretics. We talked about diuretics and how it inhibits antidiuretic hormone, encouraging the kidneys to decrease blood volume by um, increasing urination. Um, so if we uh, encourage urination, we decrease blood volume. Um, and then also we, want, we can recommend the patient to go on a low sodium diet. And that are some of the ways that we can treat edema. And that will be the end of the cardiovascular physiology chapter.